I think corruption runs deep in the soul of mankind. And it sure smells and walks like a duck. Well, it doesn't seem wrong, it is wrong. It shouldn't be up to the victims of PG&E to make sure PG&E is healthy. Where do we get the money in order to pay you? It's important for you to want PG&E to do well. We wanted to be disengaged as quickly as possible from contact with them. And here we are. This bankruptcy tethers the victims' financial futures to the performance of the company. Do you agree with that statement? Yes. We can't stop all fires, but we can stop these. To solve the crisis, we have to master its three core elements. Fire, power, money. A plate of dinner at this award-winning restaurant in Napa County starts at $350. But dining here during the pandemic cost Governor Gavin Newsom quite a bit more than that. Governor Gavin Newsom is apologizing for not following his own protocols tonight. The French Laundry Restaurant. The French Laundry. French Laundry Restaurant. So I want to apologize to you uh, because I need to preach and practice, not just preach. You know the French Laundry because it's where the governor had dinner in a small gathering at a time when he was telling Californians not to do that because of COVID. But we're more interested in it because of who he was having dinner with. It was a birthday dinner party for Newsom's close friend, Jason Kinney, a well-known lobbyist. Friend that I've known for almost 20 years. The two men shared more than a friendship. They shared an interest in PG&E. In the months before the dinner party, bankruptcy court documents show hundreds of thousands of dollars flowing from PG&E's checkbook to Axiom Advisors, the lobbying firm owned by Jason Kinney. Kinney's name shows up on the firm's billable hours, working for some of PG&E's biggest unsecured creditors. Under services rendered on the bill, the first things you see are the passage of AB 1054, the law that created a state safety certificate for PG&E, and the approval by Governor Newsom of PG&E's bankruptcy plan. Axiom reported working with the governor's office to see all of it through. PG&E's bankruptcy delivered for Kinney's clients. The plan paid them cash in full, plus interest. But not everyone PG&E owed money to had a seat at this table. Well, this is my living room and my TV. And this is where I prepare, prepare my food. In the town of Paradise, Lawrence Graham lives in a trailer now because PG&E burned his house down. They're helping each other get, a, get ahead and stepping on us to get there. The campfire was a crime with tens of thousands of victims. PG&E owes them restitution. All they care about is their bottom line. I mean, I understand business is business, but this is our lives they're messing with. But almost three years after the fire, Lawrence doesn't have his restitution from PG&E, and he needs that money to rebuild. If he doesn't break ground on a new house in the coming months, the town of Paradise threatens to evict him from his own land, along with hundreds more victims. Oh, I don't like living like this, no. Who still live camping where their houses once stood. I'm a big guy, and to live in a tiny RV, it's claustrophobic. David Breed lost his job after the fire, but he found work removing burned trees. The insurance from his mobile home didn't pay enough to rebuild. PG&E's settlement money hasn't come either. David hasn't even been told how much to expect. I would have been happier with a full cash payout from PG&E. PG&E's victims didn't get paid cash in full. What they got was a retired judge who gets paid $1,500 an hour to tell them this. It's important for you to want PG&E to do well. That's quite a thing to say to 70,000 people whose homes and loved ones PG&E incinerated, but there's a reason he said it. Judge Trotter runs the trust fund set up for victims in PG&E's bankruptcy. The Fire Victim Trust was supposed to get $13.5 billion, but PG&E only paid half of that as cash. The second part of the payment problem is where do we get the money in order to pay you. 
The other half of the money for PG&E's victims was supposed to be paid as shares of PG&E's stock. Almost a year after PG&E exited bankruptcy, I looked at the price of PG&E's stock, it was right around $10. We have 480 million shares of that stock. If it, we were able to uh, monetize it all today, we'd have $4.8 billion. Your settlement called for you to have $6.75 billion worth of stock. That has not happened. The victims were almost $2 billion short, and that was at the beginning of 2021 fire season, before the massive Dixie fire broke out in July, sending PG&E's stock price down even more, as the company admitted its power lines might be involved. The stock was never worth the amount victims were told when they voted on the bankruptcy plan. From the day PG&E exited bankruptcy, the victims needed the stock price to go up another 56% to be made whole. But it didn't just leave the victims short on money. The plan was another reward for PG&E's bad behavior. It took the people who PG&E hurt the most and turned them into financial allies. You are 25 or 24 and a half percent owners of PG&E. This means that heading into another fire season, a quarter of PG&E's fire risk belongs to its previous wildfire victims. That part of the governor's plan isn't a bug, it's a feature. And don't just take it from me, take it from PG&E's own chief financial officer. This bankruptcy tethers the victim's financial futures to the performance of the company. Do you agree with that statement? Yes. That's a really horrible way to think of it, and it's absolutely true. I, you're absolutely right. That's that's what happened, and they they did that to us. It's almost like you're held hostage by it. It shouldn't be up to the victims of PG&E to make sure PG&E is healthy. That's really insidious. I mean, if you think about it, this is like next level movie, the bad guy in the background smoking the cigar. We'll make them owners, and then we'll make them pay themselves. And there should be some adult in the room, in the government somewhere, some type of leader that would say, you shouldn't be making it the victim's responsibility to pay the victims. So what questions do you have for the governor now? Simply, why? Why would you prioritize a corporation over the victims? Because that's essentially what's happened. We put that question from Steve at the top of our list of 18 written questions to the governor. Newsom's office did not directly answer any of those questions and has declined every interview request we've sent for nearly three years. In a written statement, though, the governor's office took credit for ensuring PG&E emerged from bankruptcy in a position to swiftly compensate victims. All the victims we met disagree. They're still waiting to be paid, even though PG&E has been out of bankruptcy for more than a year. I mean, they, they know they shortchanged us. It's all about money. And the, the people that are higher up, you know, buying their way out of trouble. And it sure smells and walks like a duck. A further testament to corporations having power over people. PG&E's fire victims did get to vote, but they weren't given any alternatives. The only option on the ballot was to vote yes or no on PG&E's bankruptcy plan. It was sort of deal or no deal. Yes, exactly. Because they would have to start all the way back over again if you said no. Fire victims like Mariel didn't want to start negotiations all over again. They wanted to be done dealing with PG&E. That's what they were told a yes vote would do for them in the official voting materials approved by the bankruptcy court. The court told victims a yes vote would pay them more quickly. The safety certificate law passed by the legislature had a deadline for PG&E to get out of bankruptcy, and without this plan, if they voted no, payments would be delayed and could be reduced. Those delays could take months or years if they voted no. The victims voted for the plan. They voted to avoid delays, but they got delays anyway. The plan prioritized PG&E's exit from bankruptcy over the payment of its victims. And those delays don't just hurt victims' life plans, 
it just plain hurts them. I signed and said, yes, please. And that was why, you know, because it, it was very painful to go through all this. Every day that goes by for Muriel Wisotsky, every step she has to take to settle PG&E's killing of her mom, Colleen, keeps the trauma fresh in her mind. I have spent a lot of the last couple of years trying not to think about how horrible it must have been. Every time it comes up, it's picking the scab off again. The plan delays the healing of whole families. I try and put on the, the brave front for the family. Of, oh yeah, it was quick. Chances are she didn't feel anything. Colleen's grandson, Steve, the former firefighter. I'm pretty sure she knew the house was on fire and she wasn't gonna make it out. And that's, I don't talk about it enough, um, but that really keeps me up at night of, you know, was she expecting me? You know, was she expecting me to, you know, show up at the last, you know, be able to get there at the last second? While they've waited, victims watched PG&E reap its rewards immediately. There's no compassion towards the victims. It's more of the compassion for their bottom line. PG&E got out of the bankruptcy, it declared. It's still paying bonuses to its executives. Its shareholders didn't get wiped out. They got PG&E's victims to join them. I think corruption runs deep in the soul of mankind. And I think if any executive has a chance to line their pockets at the expense of 86 people losing their lives in paradise or the expense of the entire town burning them, do they really care? I don't know. I don't think they do. I don't think they care. If I screw up at work, I lose my job. If I speed on the road, I get a ticket. There's consequences for bad behavior. PG&E needs to be held accountable, not just given a pass or an easy way out. It's infuriating. It causes you to lose faith in government. It's not like they fixed pg &E. You know, it's not like the governor signed some magical document that fixed pg &E's infrastructure. There are two magic documents in this story the governor's approval of PG&E's bankruptcy plan, and the safety certificate law that made that plan work. Both were considered major accomplishments by the two old friends who sat down for dinner at the French Laundry.